Hello, welcome to this beating conversation in connection with the exhibition, Radical Stitch. I'm Dr. Laura Evans, Cherokee art historian, and I'm Zooming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Hello everyone, my name is Diani Whitehawk. I am Sichangu Lakota, and I'm Zooming in from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hi, my name is Terry Grease. I'm a member of the Kiowa Nation and I'm Zooming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hello everybody, my name is Elias Not Afraid. I am a Opsalaga member and a beat artist and I am Zooming in from Wixa, Michigan. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to start off with having each of the artists speak for about five minutes about their work and uh, share images with us. We'll start off with you, Diani. Sounds good. I'm gonna share my screen, so give me just a moment. All right, you get a thumbs up if y'all can see that. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm starting here uh, with an image of a case containing moccasins, porcupine quilled hair ties, and a beaded bag uh, that I made as a part of my dance regalia um, while I was attending the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they were part of my BFA exhibition. Um, I think it's important to start with this slide because most people are familiar with my practice from uh, studio arts practice that consists predominantly of two-dimensional works. My studio practice is very much founded in, in painting and mixed media pieces that incorporate beadwork and quill work. But that uh, approach of mixed media work uh, for two-dimensional pieces comes from this place of making works for cultural practice, for myself, for my family. Uh, and then I had to figure out a way to bring that into my painting practice because when I'm painting, I miss doing beadwork and quill work. And when I'm doing beadwork and quill work, I miss painting. Um, so I kind of had to figure out how to make them all happen at once. And that's what a lot of my work um, consists of today. So this is an early piece uh, in that journey of figuring out when um, or how to make them all happen at the same time. This was uh, during graduate school in about 2009, 2010. This piece is titled Cyclical. The um, cream colored stripes in the center are done with porcupine quill work and then it's stitched onto a canvas background of oil and acrylic paint. And this piece titled Continuity is the first time that I was really faced with um, contradicting value systems in my studio practice where I was in graduate school and I had to figure out how to make the conversations and the history and all the teachings that are embedded in our cultural artistic art forms um, happen within a grad school calendar. So I had to make them happen faster. And so my response to that was mimicking quill work in paint. Um, and these two moments have really informed a lot of uh, what my practice looks like today. Uh, this piece is titled Continuity and uh, it's an abstract piece about, the, um, about cultural continuity and the fact that culture can never be stagnant and it's always moving and um, reflecting a current time and space. Uh, that transitioned into an exploration of beadwork on canvas. Uh, this piece is um, a, a smaller canvas piece on an oil painted background. And these are size 13 glass beads uh, playing with the similar concept that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is an example of ways that I've continued to play with quill work and beadwork on either linen or canvas backgrounds incorporating paint. And this is the piece that's in the Radical Stitch exhibition. This is a uh, 18 inch by 48 inch mixed media piece, uh, size five vintage glass beads that are big and chunky and delicious um, over an oil painted background. Uh, and this, uh, just a few more examples of the ways that I um, bring beadwork into uh, my works on canvas. This is an untitled piece and those are uh, glass bugle beads stitched on the surface of a painted background. 
And yet another one, this one is untitled, all the colors. Those are 30 millimeter glass bugle beads stitched onto canvas. Uh, this piece is titled Carry Three, and it's uh, lane stitch and flat stitch beaded on uh, buckskin uh, and peyote stitch beaded on the handle. And then that's wrapped around this copper bucket and ladle. And um, this is an example. This is a seven foot by 10 foot painting titled She Gives Quiet Strength. And it's an example of the ways that I bring um, references to the history of uh, quill work and lane stitch beadwork into my paintings. This is a, a close up detail image of that. And then the last piece that I wanted to show was um, most current work. This is a uh, eight feet by 14 foot fully beaded piece that is um, currently up at the Whitney Biennial at the Whitney Museum in New York City. And this piece is made uh, with loomed strips of um, nine millimeter bugle beads. And all of those strips are then adhered to aluminum uh, panel background. And um, the title of this piece is Wopila Lineage. I'll hand it to the next. Elias? Okay. So this will put together as a slide. So this um, is just like a portrait of me carrying a beaded purse that I've done for the Field Museum for the uh, exhibit of Salaga Women and Warriors uh, that started last year, or back in 2020, right around when COVID. Um, this is my, like, my main medium is beadwork. I do uh, other things as far as, like, feather work. I know how to do, uh, you know, sewing and quill work, but my main focus is beadwork, and I stick with the two-needle applique technique. So the beadwork in this bag is mostly applique, needle applique. Um, the design was an incorporation of my great grandmothers and just some elements that I like to play around with like spikes. And um, it was on exhibition for about a year and over at the Field Museum, but it's one of my favorite and most uh, sentimental pieces that I've made so far. So next slide. This is just a kind of quick overview of me and who I am, where I came from when I started market. Um, go ahead, next one. So I've been beating for, since I was 12 years old and a lot of the work that I've would um, I grew up around was my great grandmother Joy Yellowtail, and she liked to do a lot of these uh, belt purses and would do the uh, use these type of tulips that crows did back in like the late uh, or late eighteen hundreds, and so I tried to like pay homage to my grandmother that way. Um, I've never met her before. Uh, I just grew up in her house, so everything that I've learned was just from what I would see laying around in boxes and stuff and would just pick it up and start messing with it, try to take it apart and put it back together. And so by doing that, I developed this, you know, to come up with designs kind of like on the spot, just because back then it was really hard for me to come up with designs. So I would just use like historic photos that are in archives or just go to powwows and see what are the beadwork that's out there. And I would try to change it up into my own way. And so uh, the cuff set that's on the left here is one of my current works and they are a pair of Kevlar, cu uh, Kevlar cuffs that were commissioned for a collector. Um, the color and design on this, I just, did the X outline in the middle and didn't plan colors or anything. I just started from the center and worked my way out and built the color and design in as I went. But the uh, the beadwork is actually um, 
layered on smoke deer hide and then under that there's a layer of kevlar ballistic uh fabric so and then under that it's layered with more kevlar so as part of my war warrior woman cuffs series next slide and so like i don't do just traditional style pieces, beadwork. Um, you know, I like to just try new things, incorporate different things, do something that I've like never done before. And uh, pictorial or like portrait style beading is my next uh, goal to like kind of experiment more with, challenge myself with. And the only time I got to do that was with a a bay that um, a collector wanted for her dog that was like her child and um, asked if I could create something that would, you know, reflect, you know, like this bond she had and with her dog and just incorporating the elk ivory around it, just kind of like, you know, for crows, we look at uh, elk teeth as like crow diamonds. So, and they're supposed to like represent love and like love last like forever. And so I try to incorporate everything in, you know, create something that's unique. Next slide. And so these two pieces, uh, the one that's on the left with the geometric was a commission piece from Wells Fargo that was to, um, I was one of five artists that were picked throughout the nation to design a, uh, to design a uh, bank card for Wells Fargo and the photo or the image had to represent what is the future of your medium like where do you see you know your work or the craft itself in like 10 20 years and the way I kind of incorporated that with is with um in crow tradition like we do a lot of geometrics and uh, floral beading but we never really like blend the two. So it's kind of my take on something that, you know, we could advance our beadwork and our floral styles, like even more by combining the two and making it look crow. The other side is uh, on the right here is a pair of cuffs from my Taboo series, which is um, items and objects that are taboo for crows to bead. So like we're told that we're not supposed to be in black, we're not supposed to be snake skulls or anything like that. So um, I, I started a set, a men's uh, crow regalia set and the first part of it were these cuffs with the king snakes. Thanks. Thank you, Elias. Um, and uh, next up is Terry Greaves. You could run my slideshow, please. Um, thank you all for inviting me up north um, to speak with you all. I really appreciate uh, being a part of this exhibition and uh, being able to speak with these fine beadworking artists, um, Elias and Diani. Um, this is the piece that is in the exhibition. Um, it is called uh, Art 2006, I believe, and I did it. Uh, as a piece of art. So much of Native American art is uh, understood as utilitarian um, and certainly antiquities, which is where I grew up. I grew up among antiquities. Um, I grew up among, the, and among all that functional art that is a part of our daily lives, uh, functional beadwork. So in this particular piece, I wanted to do something that was completely non-functional. I wanted to do something so it's two dimensional and it hangs on the wall so it serves no purpose. Um, and I wanted to uh, use an image that looked like something that anyone across the world could see and note and understand as Native American. Um, and then I put a bubble, voice bubble coming out of it with Roy Lichtenstein's Art 1964, because at the time he was questioning what was art, what was considered art. And when I did this particular piece, I was being interviewed uh, as, a, as happens. and. Um, the question du jour of every interviewer at that time was, are you a Native American artist or are you an artist? 
And I wanted to punch every one of them in the throat when they asked me that question, because there was no way that I, as a Kiowa person, could remove myself and do that. And so that was the questions that we were getting back then. Um, I haven't been asked that question, and <laughs> so hopefully we're past that. Next slide, please. This particular piece is what started off my career. Um, I won Best of Show at Santa Fe's Indian Market here in Santa Fe, as uh, wise Indian Market here in Santa Fe in 1999. I was, it was my second year ever of doing Indian Market. Uh, I was so green, I didn't know that I had won Best of Show. So, and I didn't know what that meant actually. Um, and I also looked very young, even though I was 30 years old and everyone thought a youth had won and was very upset about it. So um, this particular piece is a full-size beaded umbrella. Um, it has a parade scene on it. I grew up um, in Indian country. I grew up uh, watching Indians parade out of pride um, in who we are. Um, my mother was power, uh, royalty, power, tribal royalty when she was a young woman. And so was my auntie. She was Cheyenne tribal royalty. Um, and so this is the imagery in my mind. Uh, this is a close up of a politician. Um, many times politicians will come into our Indian country and they will ask for our votes. And this is Narciss Conman, who is in a 24 karat gold car with Indian head nickels, belching exhaust with an American flag throwing his peace sign, which at the time when I did this piece was a reference to Nixon, who threw his victory sign. Nowadays, if I were to redo this panel, he would definitely be orange with a shock of yellow hair and tiny little fingers stabbing the air. Next slide, please. I'm known for beaded tennis shoes. Um, these shoes are in collections kind of around the US and um, actually in uh, the British Museum as well. The images on the, the pair on the left are the Sun Boys and they're in reference to, um, how would I say this? It was, it would, the Sun Boys for us are how Jesus is for Christians, how Muhammad is for Islam, how Buddha is for Buddhism. Um, this is who Sun Boys are for us. And so I, uh, my children were young and they were all into superheroes at the time. And I kept, you know, I, I would go to put them to sleep at night telling them stories. And I realized that, you know, all these stories that I was telling them, these were our superhero stories. And so I created these shoes um, and I did the drawings for them. I made them into line drawings for the children so that they could um, color them in um, because it was my intention that at some point in the future, when they're laying in bed with their children and they're remembering who they are as Kiowas, that they would reflect upon this imagery that I gave, I gave them so they could tell them stories. The pair on the right are uh, my ode to uh, our Kiowa women who were abstractionists. Um, among the Kiowa people, our women are abstractionists and the men are the representative artists. The men um, are the calendar keepers and the history keepers. And so their drawings are figurative um, and the women, abstract the world and they originally abstracted it in paint on hide um, and that is how our abstractions formed and then and then grew into beadwork as beadwork became a trade item next slide please this piece um, is a piece that i'm particularly proud of uh, i did this piece right after all that crap in fallujah happened and we saw those pictures of the men hanging off those bridges my babies were very young and I was very worried for them because this world is how it is. And I know as Kiowa people that it is important for us to serve our people. And so this particular piece uh, was my reference to our Tonkanga, the Black Leggings Warrior Society um, and how we uh, place ourselves as Kiowas in the universe. Um, that's the Milky Way that runs through it with a reference to the sun, the sky world and the earth world below. Uh, I believe I've ran out of time, so I won't go in any more. Thank you, everyone. So my next question for you all, um, people new to beading may not be familiar with the ethical and value systems that each beater brings to their work. Um, could you speak about how you navigate these aspects in your own practices? Well, I'll start off because I have a story about this actually. So um, I started off making traditional objects um, like probably all of us did. 
um, as Diani showed in her slides, and I'm sure you did too, Elias. We started off at our grandmas or aunties or sister's knees looking at what they were doing and trying to emulate them because it was so beautiful and we knew it was so packed with meaning. So um, I started off making traditional objects. I made pipe bags, I made moccasins, I made all the things that we use as Indian people. Um, and, I, and I brought them to market to sell. And um, we're selling to white people. We're not, you know, by and large at these art markets not at powwows, but at art markets, we're selling to white folks. And so this one year I had made, it was the very first pair of Kiowa men's moccasins that I had ever made. I was my very first attempt at Kiowa men's moccasins. And they're particular, uh, they're very specific. There's a lot of information that's embedded into them and all of that. And so I, I wanted to make them. I thought it's time now, I, you know, I've made all these shoes. I'm, you know, I'm ready to make these, these kind of moccasins now. I made them. And there was a man, a very wealthy man, and he put a, a booth sitter in my booth at Indian Market because he wanted to have first dibs on buying those moccasins. And I was honored. I was honored that he put that man, he, you know, he hired some man to sleep in my booth overnight so that he could get those moccasins first thing in the morning. And I was truly honored by that. I mean, it, it was extraordinary to me that this guy would do that. So about Two years later, three years later, I can't remember how many, how long it was. I got invited to that man's home and his home was filled with native art. I mean, like every best of show pot that's happened in the past 10 years. And I just, I was, I was floored with, with the, what he had um, and the extraordinary nature of everything that he had. And I saw my moccasins sitting on one of his tables off to, uh, in one of his hallways. And I went right over to them and I grabbed them because they were kind of messed up. I have a certain way I like to have them displayed, the way they're stuffed and all that. And they weren't quite right. So I touched him. He wasn't in the room. They weren't around me. And I went over there and I put my hands on them and I started fixing them. And as soon as I touched them, the hide was hard. I use uh, brain tan deer hide. That's what I use um, in those traditional pieces like that. And as soon as I touched those moccasins, I was sad immediately because I knew that those moccasins would never be danced in. They would never fulfill the purpose of what they were and how I meant them as my very, very first pair of Kiowa men's moccasins made in a traditional manner with all of that intent and thought that goes into our traditional object. And it was right then that I vowed that I would never again make a traditional object for sale. I know we have to. We have to pay the bills and that's what we have to do. This is what we have to offer as Native people. So I mean nothing by anyone else I mean that for me, I then chose that I could no longer do that because the intention behind our traditional objects is so clear to us when we're doing it because we have people in mind, we have things in mind, we have prayer in mind. And that I realized that that translation, that value system was at odds and that I would never be able to explain to that person what they are and that that. So for me, then I put all of those things away and now I make them for Indian people when they ask me and I get great joy out of that, enormous joy out of it. And I, and then it forced, it pushed my artistic process in another direction where I was allowed to use technical skills and all this other stuff that I had in my head. These were my rules, but I was able to expand it into new form. And so in, I take it as a good thing that lesson. It was a good thing for me. It, it showed me clarity as to what I'm making for our people, why I'm making it. I knew that. And what I'm making for sale in the art market. And that these two value systems, oftentimes they're like two ships passing in the night. They don't even see each other. We don't even know that they're different, but uh, I can acknowledge it in the arts that I make. Thank you. Can I respond to that? <clears throat> um, Thank you, uh, Elias and Terry, for everything that you guys shared already. I, it gives me great joy to be in conversation with you guys around the topic of beads um, and in, in uh, the topic of this show. I was really excited when the invitation for this show came through because I think, you know, we could all be happily talking about beads all day, all month, all year, all forever. Um, so, Terry, I, I just... I'm over here, like, nodding my head and giving myself uh, 
a good head exercise to everything that you're saying because I, I mean I feel so similarly um, and I wanted to share a couple things because they um, just uh, mirror what you've shared so well so the the piece that I showed the red beadwork around that copper bucket and vessel the carry series um, I, I want to talk about that because it, it backs up what you were talking about for your wall piece, the art piece, um, but also this conversation that you're asking about us now, or asking us now, Laura, on ethics and values. And, and we spoke a little bit earlier, and it would be easy to talk about so many things when we, we place the conversation first from the place of values. Um, I do my best to make all of my decisions in the studio based on my value system, based on a cultural value system and a personal value system that is guided by that cultural value system. And so that, that series, that carry series is about that conversation as well with this idea of functional works versus um, works within the art market with a capital A that has excluded historically purposefully excluded and othered indigenous artwork as something else, right? So we have been taught that um, beadwork and quill work and parfletch work and weaving and ceramics and basically all the art made by um, black folks, brown folks and women historically has been othered as something other than art with a capital A. And that's gone, you know, it, it, there are a lot of, um, categories that have been created that help classify that work as something other than, and one of them is functional art, one of them is self-taught art, one of them is craft, one of them is design and so forth, right? And so Native art has, you know, had those categories placed upon it and functional being one of them. So for me that, that bringing in um, pieces that uh, would function into gallery spaces was an intentional move, the same conversation that you did with yours, flipping it in the other direction. So for me, taking mine off of the canvas and then putting them on functional pieces and putting them into those museum spaces and gallery spaces gives me the opportunity to have that exact same conversation to tell folks are, you know, to impress upon people to think more critically about the way that we tell our art stories, the way we tell our art histories. Um, and the way that that those art histories have excluded our work from the majority of the conversation, unless it's that other class that's you know, it's Native American, uh, you know, art history, and it's a different class, and it's a different gallery, and it's a different topic. It's not art with a capital A, which um, I think is extremely short-sighted and just not the truth. Um, so by creating that series of works that are beaded on functional objects and then placing those functional objects in those gallery spaces. Um, I want people to think about what we choose to carry, what we're gonna choose to carry forward, what we're gonna choose to honor and how and why. But also when we as native people bring the work our works into those spaces where they function differently. They're not gonna function the same as when we might make them to dance in them or to um, have, you know, whatever cultural practice is gonna happen with that particular work. It's a different function in the museum and gallery space and acknowledging that and then asking ourselves when we choose to do that, what is the new function that it serves in that space? What do we, what do we choose to bring with us that could be beneficial for people at large, for humanity, for the arts? And what do we reserve for ourselves? What isn't, what doesn't belong in those spaces or what needs to be um, protected and, and, and left out of those spaces? Um, so I think about those things a lot, you know, and, and they guide what the choices that I make in um, what I choose to put in a gallery or a museum space. And then the choices that I make when I'm making works that are for family or friends, um, just, you know, the, the same that you were talking about it, Terry. So I just, I really appreciate hearing you talk about it. And it made me think, well, now we need an exhibition 
of everybody's work who's who's thought about that you know the like are you an artist or are you a native artist are you a traditional artist or are you a contemporary artist and you know just works on that topic at large that's that's my, like my show my head was um putting that show together <laughs> as you're talking about it Okay, so I'll go. <laughs> um, you know, like, thank, first of all, thank you all to having me here. It's an honor to be talking with, with these two incredible beat artists that I've looked up to and, um, you know, just growing up, viewing your work from afar and to actually being on a panel with you guys, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, me being uh, a young artist, you know, starting out pretty young, um, you know, there's like, I I wasn't taught beadwork in the sense from like my aunts or my grandmothers or stuff because we came kind of came from a really toxic family, so a lot of the beadwork traditions, dancing, all that, it it stopped within a generation, a couple generations within our family. And so by me just wanting to learn and dabble in that part, it there was these other things that came up within our family as, you know, but you're a man, only women would be. And so I was like, oh, okay. And I never knew what that meant as, you know, being a kid. And so it didn't deter me from like wanting to be, it just made me want to be more. And so being told that, you know, you can't do this or you can't do that, or, you know, you're gonna, if you do this, bad things are gonna happen to you. Like it, not until I got older, I was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna do it anyway. I don't care like if people like it or not. And like the big thing for it was, was like skulls and, uh, you know, snakes and stuff like that. And so when I would make these items, I would try to make them like really colorful and vibrant and like have florals in there so that it would take away from the actual imagery and the taboo of it all. And, you know, like growing up as a male beater, I kind of learned like, you know, back in the 1920s, like when the Christians came to our tribe, they put a lot of gender roles on a lot of activity and, like artistic things that our tribe has done and you know categorize it as this is women's work and this is men's work so for like a crow man to be beating was kind of taboo within itself because it's like well are you are you saying you're a woman like because I've heard I've heard it all but um I think it's just kind of remembering like having to remind these people like our you know, our tribal members and all that before, you know, 1920 and all the assimilation and stuff that we had, you know, value on all the stuff that we do and that not only just one particular person is supposed to do all the work, which is, you know, the female, like this was a shared thing amongst the community. And so when I create something, I'm always trying to do something that's different but i like to experiment too with a lot of like high quality materials or like just exotic fabrics or things and just mesh the two in together but keeping the foundation of my beadwork um like as traditional as it could be like beading on buckskin and using the geometrics and curl colors and keep those in my work along with like embellishments and um like functionality and stuff so it's it's in a sense it's just kind of like from people back home they always say i'm like this is a rebel beater I'm always making stuff that pisses everyone off but it's it's just my way of you know like expressing myself as an artist and me being crowed or that was one thing too that I would get asked is like, so is this considered pro bead work? Or, and I'm like, if I do something like say you beat an apple, 
they'll be like, oh, is this crow pubic? I'm like, well, yeah, I beat it in on crows. So it's like, the kind of question is that? <laughs> um, but one thing too, it's like, that comes with the territory, like being from the like Northern Plains tribes is, you know, we, our last names is, are pretty, we're shortened down. The government shortened our, our names and gave us like first Christian names. And so within our family, not afraid was just old man, not afraid, shortened down to not afraid and was given a, a Christian first name. So if you notice that like Indian market, I won't have a banner or anything with my last name because that becomes a prop for some people. Like, oh, I want you to stand next to it. And I wanna like, that's really your last name. Oh, my daughter's gonna like, get a kick out of this. Like, so it's like, it defeats the purpose. Like, you know, I'm here, you're here for the art and you're for the artist and the work. It's not to, you know, pick apart a name or something that you've done. So it's, yeah, it's tough out there, but it's manageable. <laughs> On the surface, beating seems like a, a very organized and meticulously planned e experience. Um, is there an emotional drive to beating too? I'll go. <laughs> um, I like to say I'm an, like an emotional beater just because when I get angry upset or if I'm like excited or something like I have to be doing something I can't just sit somewhere and just you know watch tv or anything so I'll put that into my work and a lot of my best work comes from something with a strong emotion like you know it could be a death in the family it could be a new collaboration um the way I just kind of like channel that excitement and all is like I put it through my work and um, I like to call some of my work like the, the work that I really hold like near and dear to me I call them whole cruxes like based off of Harry Potter it's like a piece of your soul latched to it and usually those are like pieces that I keep are that are like in museums right now and it just kind of you know it's there, it's a part of, you know, me that's fine, but it's not just a bag or it's just not a piece of, you know, bead a trinket. There's like so much that goes into these objects, like, you know, the stories the, like that go behind it, like the background, like the, it can even come down to your color, like, cause I use a lot of colors that my great grandmother used to like to use. So it's, I, I see beading as therapy. It is therapy. But yeah. So um, I uh, beadwork as an emotional thing, um, absolutely, a thousand percent. Um, and again, I reference like our our mode of beadwork which is not this studio art stuff that's a part of this museum show and all this, all right? That's a, that's a different thing. And, but driven, again, it's related, but our, those old objects are always driven from that place because we're thinking about someone, we have something in mind when we're doing it. So all of the traditional objects that I have ever made in my life have the person that I have in mind in them and all of the prayer that goes with it because I'm thinking about them the whole time I'm doing it. And every choice that I'm making from the design to the colors, to how it's formed, how it's sewn together, every single thing I'm doing, I have that person in mind. So that is such a different way of making art than something that you are gonna take to market, you don't know who's gonna see it, you have to explain yourself, it's hanging on a white wall if you're lucky and not on dirty pavement. You know, there's a whole different thing that goes on with it. However, as artists, as artists, I, I think it's our voice, right? It's like, it's our language, it's how we communicate, it's like, it's like, it's like in us. So our, our emotions, my emotions, definitely come through in the art that I make. 
And they range from everything, like Eliza saying, like anger to sadness, pure joy and happiness. All of those things come out in the story that I'm telling in the work that I'm making. I'm a pictorial artist in that I do like a man. I make pictures. Kiowa women don't make pictures, but I'm like a man, like a rebel, <laughs> like Elias. <laughs> we tried crazy stuff. Um, uh, but that that is, it's all driven. My point is that it is all driven from an emotional space. And I definitely think as an artist, we can't help but do that. I agree with all of that. Um, and I also am, I, I've been muting myself, but I've been really cracking up because it makes me happy, <laughs> Elias and Terry, that you guys are, um, I, I love Elias that you're like, I'm a man, I'm not supposed to bead, so I'm going to bead. Uh, not supposed to use black, so I'm going to use black. I'm not supposed to do snakes or skulls, so I'm going to do them both. Um, all the one piece. Like, <laughs> um, I love that. It brings me joy. And um, I didn't even think about that, what you said. Terry, tell you said it that you know you're beating pictorially, uh, and I guess I'm not breaking those rules, but um, <laughs> maybe um, breaking my own. I don't know, or make making uh, breaking art history rules. I think has been my job and my role, and what I'm trying to disrupt is hierarchies that have been imposed on. Um, our community hierarchies that have been imposed on society at large. I mean, the art, the arts um, inevitably reflect our society, right? And our society has a lot of flaws and um, it's, it's reflected in the field. And so how do we start um, thinking about that and, and telling our stories in a more healthy and truthful way? And that's, that's kind of been my driving force. Um, but as far as, Oh, so there's, I guess there's two things I wanted to respond to. One, I think that, so Elias, what you're talking about as far as like you doing uh, beadwork and, you know, historically maybe, you know, the, the men in your tribe weren't doing beadwork or, you know, Terry, historically women were doing abstraction. But that, that piece that I started with early in my presentation, um, continuity, that's about that, right? Like our our work is deeply rooted in who we are and, and it all comes from the lineage of that art that our ancestors upheld to get us to where we're at today. And now we get to pick that up and continue with that, but it's going to look different in 2022 than it did in 1822 or 1892 or any, you know, it, it, it has to, we have to respond to a current time and place and our gender roles have been disrupted in the way that maybe those roles were, um, you know, in the 1800s when we all had different jobs and were collectively coming together to do those jobs to sustain a community. Um, those gender roles are interrupted and they're different now. And so I, I think that all of that is important to consider when we're thinking about how we operate um, and how we contribute to cultural continuity through our practices. Um, so I'm glad you're doing beadwork is, is, is the, um, the <laughs> summary of that. Um, but the second, Laura, can you tell me, give me a little, there was one other thing I wanted to say and I, I forgot, can you, what was the prompt again for the second oh. question? Uh, is there an emotional drive? Oh yeah, the emotion, sorry, that was what I needed. <laughs> um, yes, an emotional drive without a doubt for all the reasons that you're talking about Terry and Elias. And the one other thing that I wanted to add is like, for me, what I've done is very much built off of those teachings. You know, what, when we're making a pair of moccasins for somebody, um, it's so specific and you're putting that love and that care and that nurturing into dressing that person. And so much of our, of our older teachings and value systems are embedded in that work, right? Um, for when I'm making works for gallery and museum spaces, when I'm making two-dimensional works, I'm very much thinking about um, the audience that is gonna 
have an exchange with that work. It's not exactly the same as that one-to-one -one relationship, but I bring a lot of those teachings with me and I make sure that they're acknowledged in my studio, not only through me, but anybody that's working with me. Like that, that Whitney piece, it took us 18 people to, to do that beadwork. Um, and every single person, you know, before we were brought in with vast majority of those people were native folks that are already bead workers. And then we had a small handful of, of um, other folks um, that weren't native. We had a couple uh, BIPOC folks at large and a couple non-native folks. And um, every single person though had to have like they were either people that were raised with beadwork and understood that intentionality that we're taught when we sit down to do our work, we're thinking about how what we're putting into the work and how that's going to, um, how those intentions extend beyond us to the wearer. Um, and I talk about that in the studio too. I, you know, I ask people, I, you know, you, you can't, you can't use and come to my studio and beat. Um, you can't come here um, upset and angry. There's this is a drama-free studio. Uh, we don't talk smack in the studio. We don't like we're thinking about all of those things. Um, I, you know, I'm like I don't want you to be bead beating if you're having a terribly hard day. If you're having a terribly hard day, go take care of yourself. You know, that's that's not um, what what we want to bring into this space because I'm thinking very much about the fact that like for me, the work is then a gift and an offering to the audience. And, and for myself, I have like a number of audiences that I'm thinking about, but first and foremost is, is other native people. When they walk into those public art spaces that have historically excluded us, um, they deserve to see their lives celebrated and honored in, in those spaces. And so I'm thinking about what the work can give to them. Um, and, and so for me, all that intentionality, that love, that emotion, it's, it's without a doubt beaded into those works. Um, and I'm also thinking about what uh, our teachings and what our gifts and practices can give to people outside of the Native community. And I'm thinking about relationship building and I'm thinking about how through storytelling, we can get to know each other better and when we get to know each other better, we're equipped to practice compassion. So it's without a doubt an emotional undertaking, even if there's hours and days and times where it's just like the mechanical, you know, I got to make this fill. <laughs> but I'm thinking about those things inevitably throughout, throughout the work. I wanted to ask about the potential for frustration and burnout. I mean, I, like, it's interesting, all of you have like this rebellion theme has come up, but rebelling is a lot of work. Um, it's, 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 uh, it can be exhausting. So um, I wanted to know if self care is needed as you're going about this work and what does that look like for you? The only time I've ever needed self care while doing beadwork is when I'm making the capital A art pieces. And the self-care for that is making traditional work. That's me. Ooh, I like that answer. Um, for, for me, I'll say it's, uh, I have to stretch a lot because it hurts my body, wrecks my body. <laughs> um, and a lot of that is, yeah, the, the, the bigger work. Um, but, you know, when I'm doing any kind of bee work, I just have to think about about my body. So I've got to move, I've got to stretch, I've got to get up and take breaks. Um, I'm with Elias to drink a lot of coffee and uh, a lot of water and thinking about my food, eating plenty, um, not starving myself. Uh, and you have to take breaks too beyond just like a 20 minute break within the day, but there's times when I have to listen to my body and take a day off or do something else, shift gears and move my body in a different way, doing something else so that then I can come back to that work. Um, so, and, and I talk about that um, with anybody that helps any of the studio assistants as well about how hard it can be on your body if you're not thinking about it and if you're not careful. Um, Cause I wanna be able to do it as long as possible. Okay. 
yeah um self-care is a a must for me i kind of learned it out the hard way when back in 2000 what was it end of 2019 2020 um I was just like on this roll of getting stuff done, coming up with new things and um, not listening to my body, you know, my back and my knee and um, like starting to hurt and stuff. And I just kept pushing through and pushing through and um, until I finally, my body was just like, we're taking a month off. (laughs) And I was in bed for like a month. Like I could not do anything i exhausted myself like so like much that it was it was insane where like it started to affect my wrists and um so i started to do the whole scare thing and um and then too like with for me like my self-care like my happy place is when i'm in my studio beating because before like without um before I did bead work like you know I was an addict before and so like becoming sober and um you know living that trying to live a positive lifestyle where it's like I'm not gonna let certain things like trigger me into uh going backwards in my progression or within like my healing so uh self-care for me is taking a week off and or taking a day out of the week or every two weeks and talk to a therapist or a counselor just because it's someone that I don't know that doesn't know me and I'm able to you know get everything and anything out there and it's for a lot of old like I don't want to say older people but um like within my mom's range like self-care to them is you know like burying it under the rug and so like trying to learn new different ways of self-care like reteaching myself from what you, what I thought used to be self-care was actually toxic and destroying my body to, you know, finding something new. But same thing with beadwork. Too much beadwork is will put you out. And so I try to, you know, that balance of being out in nature, like recharge my batteries, go for a nature walk and or go for a drive and just getting away from my studio, just, you know, spending time with my partner and just, just you know being away from it but then come back to it and it like it's it's like my safe space so yeah but yeah balance yeah well thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts your feelings your your artwork with us And I hope that our conversation here is helpful for people who are watching this as part of a beating workshop. I hope you remember to take breaks and care for yourself. And I hope this sparks a lot of discussion. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here with you all. Wado. Thank you all. I appreciate you all. Uh